Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to BrainMap. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Lucio Friedman. Uh, Professor Friedman earned his BSc in chemistry and PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Buenos Aires. He undertook a postdoctoral studies at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory with Alex Pines and then joined the faculty of the University of Illinois uh, of at the Department of Chemistry in 1992, where he became a full professor in 1999. In 2001, he moved to the Weizmann Institute, where he currently heads the Department of Chemical and Biological Physics, as well as the Chlor Institute of High Field Spectroscopy and Imaging. Since 2012, he is also the Chief Scientist in Chemistry and Biology in, in the US National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. And Professor Friedman recognitions include the Dreyfus, Sloan, Beckman, Lucky and Varian, and Kulthoff Prizes, a US NSF Career Fellowship, and the Outstanding Immigrant Prize from the Israel Ministry of Science and Absorption. He received the ERC grant and was also chairing the scientific conferences of ENC and Euromar. From 2010 till 2021, he was also the editor in chief of the Journal of Magnetic Resonance. I would just like to remind the audience to please address any question you have, even during the talk, uh, using the Q&A box. Dr. Friedman, thank you very much for coming here today. The virtual stage is all yours. Thank you all. Thanks. Uh, I hope that everyone can see me and, and see my slide and hear me well. Uh, it's a pity I wanted to visit your center many times, and I actually spent the summer in uh, uh, at MIT and, uh, and gave many seminars over there, but they didn't have a chance. And now that they have a chance, uh, I cannot travel. Well, next time. So I'd like to tell a little bit of a, of a story where, where I mix a, a variety of uh, MRI and NMR topics with a common uh, denominator in uh, water. And of course, we know that MRI uses water to map, to get images, but it goes well beyond just uh, getting a spin density or the density of water. It can be used in order to, to track the development of fibers and to see the brain in action. And it's very sensitive and it's very non-invasive. You can do it on, on basically uh, anyone. So, so, so this is wonderful. But in order to get all this wonderful information, you also need sometimes some special tools. And the one that I'd like to start with is uh, something that the uh, it's very well known to, to all of you, I believe. It's echoplanar imaging, Sir Peter Mansfield's uh, method for collecting 2D images in a single scan, which is the basis of functional MRI, that is the, to, to, to see the brain in action by, by changes in uh, relaxation, how changes in relaxation affect water, or uh, uh, tracking the diffusion, and, and so, for instance, getting the, the connectivity between axons uh, in the brain by looking at, at diffusion and isotropies. Now, uh, although all these methods would like to get water in a very homogeneous uh, environment as the only uh, sample that, that they see, uh, we know that also that fat and fielding homogeneities challenge echoplanar imaging. I'm showing here a few examples of uh, of our own work uh, on the on the left i'm showing some animal cases you can see that the brain of a mouse on a seven tesla mri looks pretty well but you can also see that there are lots of distortions in some areas of the brain like here on top on the olfactory valve and you see the ears also make their distortions you can see also here that the, there is a pregnant mouse and you have this all these little fetuses that are so nicely shown in the anatomical images, but the, the, the fat in the abdomen and the motion and the, the fact that it, it, the, the field is not homogeneous makes, a, in combination with the diffusion weighting gradients, makes the, this kind of, a, of organs very difficult to target by EPI. Something similar we find in a, in a, a diffusion weighted imaging of targeting water in regions outside the brain, for instance, in the breast. This is, this is an early example of, of some of the studies we did, trying to compare the information that you could get on a lesion by the addition of, of a contrast agent versus the, the information you could get by doing an ADC map, where you can see here the lower ADC, the lower apparent diffusion coefficient of the tumor in the breast. But you also see that if you have cysts or if you have fat and, uh, and water coexisting in the breast and of course motion and respiration and, and cardiac pulsation and so on, the images can get uh, quite uh, 
distorted. Now, we came to this, uh, to address this problem of, of targeting uh, water in these imaging experiments, driven in a way from developments that we did in the field of NMR. And in particular, uh, a little bit over a decade ago, we started developing methods that just like MRI could uh, collect multidimensional data in a single shot, but not just for the MRI experiment, but for any NMR experiment. And I'm showing here two very common NMR, to the NMR experiments collected on proteins in which without any a priori knowledge of what the chemical shifts are, where the protons fall, where the nitrogens in the protein are or anything, you can just get very conventional looking to the NMR spectra correlations between protons and between protons and heteronuclei, but the, the catch is that these experiments were collected just in a single shot. Now, we're not going to talk about this single shot to the NMR experiments, but uh, I, I'm going to talk about their application a little bit in an imaging context. The physics of this experiment is different from the physics of ecoplanar imaging. They are based on the application of a frequency swept pulse in the presence of a magnetic field gradient. That could be an excitation pulse, as I'm showing in this cartoon, or it could be an inversion pulse. The final result of applying a frequency swept pulse in the presence of a gradient is that instead of having a linear phase applied on the spins, as you do when you apply a, ma a magnetic field gradient, you have a quadratic phase because uh, you progressively excite spins and the frequency is also spatially dependent. So, so the product of the two give you a quadratic phase. If you now apply an acquisition gradient that that's a linear term to the evolution phase of the spins, you can see that this will shift the stationary point of the parabola. And as it does so, it rasterizes the, the density of the protons, the image that you're trying to observe this in this particular case along the y-axis. And it gives you the, the image without the use of a numerical Fourier transform. And indeed, these two-dimensional protein NMR spectra I was showing you before do not involve a Fourier transform. In, in, in their acquisition. They, they, are, they come out as echoes in the time domain and, and the echoes are the peaks that you see in the spectrum. In a similar fashion here, the, the, the signal in the time domain or in case space, because it's, it's actually the action of the acquisition gradient over time that matters, that gives you the image. And so in principle, the, 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 the sequence does not, if you extend it to two dimensions, it does not look very different from an EPI sequence or a SPINEC API sequence in this particular case, but it's intrinsically very different in the sense that the x-axis, the readout axis is still read out by a gradient and it involves a Fourier transform. But each one of these phase encoding blips or these spatial temporal encoding blips, what it does is it moves that parabola a little bit farther in space. And so it, you're not bound by the usual criteria of Nyquist in terms of the strength of these gradients or the duration and so on. Mm -hmm. And you can actually tune the bandwidth that you're going to be, up, uh, with which you're going to be reading the y-axis in this particular case to whatever fielding homogeneity is affecting the reading. Furthermore, notice that if you have an excitation frequency, uh, 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 encoded excitation, spatially encoded 90 degree pulse and a 180 degree pulse that refocuses the spins, it also refocuses the intravoxel inhomogeneities. And as you collect these blips, you get a special kind of echo, which unlike the spin echo, which only gives you a refocusing of inhomogeneities in the middle of the TE, here it gives you a refocusing of the inhomogeneities throughout your acquisition. Time. We call that full refocusing, and that will improve the images uh, quite, quite a bit. And the other thing is, since you're not doing Fourier transform of the data, you, you can interleave data, you're directly collecting it in spatial space, so, so you, you don't have folding if you do data interleaving, and, and the, you can zoom without folding and, and other practical conveniences. Over the last few years, uh, last couple of years, we've, we've developed another spatial temporally encoded uh, strategy where instead of applying a parabola, we apply a, a hyperbola to the faces of the spins. We call this cross-term span. And what I'm showing in this cartoon is a comparison of how these different single scan methodologies react to a deteriorating external magnetic field. And I'm purposely de-shimming the magnet here. You can see it here on the column on the, on the, on the left. And the multi-scan image I'm, I'm showing you here, I hope you can see a dotted red square. 
it, it gets a little bit distorted, but not much. It only gets distorted along the readout axis. EPI pretty quickly goes away, particularly first in the face encoding axis, but then in both axes. SPEN is much more resilient to the field homogeneities. Eventually, it goes away. And this new method that, that where we do the special temporal encoding using the field homogeneity, actually, the field, we, instead of trying to overcome the field homogeneity, the inhomogeneity has become part of the, of the spatial encoding process, you can see that, that basically we have even fewer distortions in the single scan images than in the multi-scan acquisitions. And so we've been uh, enabling, we've been playing with, with, with these uh, methods to, to, to interrogate water and the information that water can give in, in uh, systems that, that before we could not tackle. And I was showing you before some diffusion weighted images of fetuses inside mice inside the mouse you can see here now what what we get with spend both in terms of the b0 what what would be the the equivalent of the anatomical image and what we get in terms of adc maps and what we get in terms of dti maps and again these are not animals that you can uh, hold because you know they are fetuses is alive inside a live mouse which is anesthetized but other than that it's uh, you know they are moving around and floating around and, and you can you can actually see many 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 nice details. You can see layers in all the placentas that are known from <clears throat> histology, and you can see the CSF inside the developing brain. This is a pretty little brain. It's a 14th day of a pregnancy. It's, it's actually pretty small, about a millimeter, and still. And of course, these are live animals, and still you can get this pretty nice data. The same happens with challenging areas. You apply this, for instance, to see this slower diffusion uh, cases that are associated to tumors, tumors in breast, tumor in prostate. And you can see that, that the quality, even these are different B values, different amount of diffusion weightings for those who do uh, diffusion uh, imaging. Uh, I tell you, this, these are values that go, the, the initial column is B0, and then we go from uh, 800 to 1800. Uh, uh, B values, and you can see that, that the, as, as, as the diffusion gets severely weights the image, you get highlighted in the resulting image the same as you can highlight with the, with the injection of a contrast agent that localizes in the tumor, and we can do that into a millimeter, a sub-millimeter in-plane resolution. I know that this is not a brain, but this is a brain, and I know that this is a brain seminar, but but the we're going to go in and out of the brain. Talking about brain, this is the, the other method I was telling you on a, on a volunteer that has metal dentures. And you can see how the metal dentures distort in these axial images as you go up the brain, the API data. And you can see that, that in the SPEN case, you have everything. You have the eyes, you have the nose, you have the ears, and, and you also had all the lower part of the neck. Now you pay a price, you pay a price in terms of, uh, of signal to noise because of, of the the fact that you're not doing this, uh, the Fourier transform, we compensate for that using a different kind of processing called super resolution, and that compensates for it quite well. Now, these were cases where water is our friend, and, and, and we use water for uh, uh, getting the information that we want, but we, 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 we know, and, and everyone knows, that actually there is more information out there if you look at things other than water, we, water is important, but we're not made just out of water. And unfortunately, water, when we're trying to, to look at the NMR signatures inside, for instance, a brain, it's not necessarily a friend. It becomes a little bit more of a, of a foe because it's a huge signal and it complicates the observation of these little signals that uh, come from the metabolites. Now, a, an important way in which you can still use the fact that water is uh, easy to observe and get some spectral signature from the metabolites is via the CEST experiment, chemical exchange saturation transfer. And the CEST is, is a very well-known experiment. It was developed by Bob Balaban and, and, and Peter Van Zyl and, and have uh, used it enormously. It's a field in and of itself. And I'm showing here some cartoon courtesy of uh, nearby Yada from Johns Hopkins that tells you how CEST works. You irradiate a particular chemical group that is slabile. That means that it exchanges in, in an easy way with the solvent. And as it, ex it gets saturated, it, it uh, attenuates the, the signal of the solvent. 
And because the exchange happens relatively fast and the solvent doesn't forget that it, it's been saturated by this off resonance radio frequency pulse, you can see that you can saturate many protons and observe the signature of many protons uh, while you're only saturating one. And uh, this is uh, the, the amplification factor of CES. And we, we hypothesize that if we were to repeat these experiments at high fields, this experiment would become, uh, could become much better. And to become much better, of course, signal to noise gets better with field. But what's more important, the chemical shift separation between the site you're trying to saturate and the water that you observe becomes bigger. And as that separation becomes bigger, you can, first of all, you touch less the water. And second, you can uh, uh, accommodate a larger range of uh, chemical exchange rates and they can be faster. And it turns out that the, the enhancement of this experiment is given by the product of the T1 of the water time the exchange rate. If you can accommodate, say, 1,000 uh, hertz exchange rates and your, your T1 also lengthens, the water's T1 also lengths, lengthens supposedly with increasing field, and then, then you could have a, an enhancement in the magnification factor that becomes much better with field. And so uh, we... And I, in particular, uh, you know, I'm associated with the high magnetic field lab, so I'm always looking, I'm always looking for experiments where the improvements in the in the MAR experiment does not just grow linearly with field because that doesn't pay much, but here we are expecting a supralinear uh, improvement. And so, in, in experiments that we did in the National Magnetic Field Lab, which is a international user facility where you can actually submit a project, get scanner time, and either bring your animal, send your animal, or have the magnet lab buy and, and, and feed and trick your animal. Uh, we've been investigating that. And you can see this is what the CES spectrum looks on, on, on the magnet lab's 21.1 uh, Tesla system. Uh, these are different regions that correspond, say, to the corpus callosum and to gray matter. And, and you can see that there are fine, fine structure features and of course, everything rides on, a, on the water self-saturation. When you put your offset of irradiation on zero, and zero for these people that do this means water. Uh, it's not the zero of your usual chemical sheep scale. They put the, the zero at water. Then you get self-saturation of water. That's not very informative. And you get kind of a Lorentzian line. But then there are all these uh, deviations from a simple Lorentzian line, and, and they can be modeled. As a, and if you subtract them, you get something that resembles a little bit uh, an NMR spectrum, a little bit. And so we, we investigate how do these experiments look uh, at 900 megahertz. And the, what I'm showing you here are the symmetries between these, these two traces I was showing you here, between, say, the, the plus 3 ppm irradiation and the minus 3 ppm irradiation. On, a, on the brain of a rat, which has been, uh, in which we've injected the uh, glioomal cells that develop pretty quickly into a tumor. And you do not see the tumor easily in the anatomical images, but you see that the tumors quite easily in the asymmetry of these shapes. Say, if you look at them at 4.5 at ppm, 4 ppm, 3.5 ppm is the strongest. You can even see them a, a week after, after implantation. <clears throat> And this is consistent with what the other people have seen in terms of, of detecting gliomas in brain using CES. The only difference is that most of the reports of the, that have been done in the literature, they give contrast in the order of a you know, couple of percent. And here the contrast exceeds 10%. So indeed, it's, it's the same contrast that you'd see at lower field, but magnified by the effect of the high magnetic field. Now, if you subtract that self-saturation I was showing you before, then you don't get much difference between the normal tissue and the glioma. So it's not really in the, in the metabolite part that, is, that you see the difference. The big difference comes when you compare the baseline. You know, you take, you take uh, the baseline, that means uh, the, 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 what, what is left after you subtracted the water self-saturation, if you compare what happens downfield from water and upfield from water, you see that there is a huge difference. Uh, the normal tissue gives you a very large contrast here shown in, in green. And when the glioma comes in, that contrast goes down a lot. And that, the reason for that is that, that the, the CES experiment 
that I showed you that uh, with that cartoon is actually more complicated than what that cartoon explains. And, and this is very nicely explained also in this paper of uh, Van Zyl and co-workers, which show that there is indeed this direct contribution of the exchanging amines and, and hydroxyl groups and, and amino groups in the proteins and, and, and so on with the water. But there is also an indirect effect that comes from cross relaxation of groups like CHs that do not exchange with water, but they are cross relaxing uh, with water with the lava, the lava protons that you're saturating. And so if you if you saturate the CH, it's also the case that the NH changes and that within that exchanges with the water, you see the signature of the CH in the water. And there is, to complicate matters even more, there is a third contribution which looks solid light. You see, it's this, uh, what's called the magnetization transfer contribution, which comes not from small molecules or rapidly moving molecules. It comes from the semi-solid matrix that you don't usually see. And that semi-solid matrix, in some way, it's also communicating with the water and so it is that semi-solid matrix that the, the magnetization transfer, you can see here how dramatically changes uh, in the region that has the tumor cells implanted, it just goes away. And, and the reason for that is that, that these are called also cross relaxation effects and they depend on the strength of what's called the dipolar coupling, how strongly the through space fields of the, of the semi-solid matrix communicate with the water and apparently the tumor just dissolves the tissue and so that semi-solid matrix becomes you know much less semi-solid and so the efficiency of this cross cross relaxation uh, goes down and that's why you go from this green impact on the water to this red impact now i'd like to make a, a, a detour of, of of a few minutes and tell you about another way in which water might or might not i don't know be useful for, for looking at metabolites. This tries to use water to look at metabolites. There, uh, there are many ways out there and, and many people are searching for new ways of, of, of looking at metabolism. And this is a wonderful breakthrough that, that comes from uh, Wei Chen that I'm illustrating here with data coming from, from uh, Robin de Graff and co-workers uh, at Yale, which uh, realized that today the sensitivity of MR is, is good enough. And again, this is something that, you know, high fields could have a, a very nice role to play, that uh, you could envision looking at the imaging, not just looking, because that had been done before by, by Ackerman and by others, uh, by Joe Ackerman and others, you could envision not just looking, but imaging the distribution of deuterated compounds by spectroscopic imaging. And they realized that if you inject deuterated glucose, that could become lactate as well as, as a glutamine and other metabolites. And that could allow you to see metabolism coming from the glucose. And I'm showing here the same, we, we saw this, we, we, we jumped to the opportunity and then we use the fact that we also have a high field machine to put together a double resonance configuration. And we started injecting glucose when the glucose is uniformly uh, enriched the spectra are not so clear, but it is true that when the, unit, the glucose is just enriching one of the carbons, spectra become simpler and you go from this red spectrum here, for, for this is a, a naive a mouse a brain deuterium spectrum, you go from this uh, red trace, which only has the signal of the natural abundance water, which is a wonderful thing you have to have because that gives you a 10 millimolar absolute concentration ruler, uh, give or take uh, a couple of millimolars that, that you can use to quantify metabolic rates and so on and metabolic concentration. But you see that when you inject the deuterated glucose after a few minutes, you have an increase in the water signal and you have, had had been uh, observed in these other studies, the appearance of, of this GLX and the lactate peak, the methyl lactate. And uh, I was showing you earlier a few uh, fetal studies and fetal metabolism is, is very important and, and abnormalities in pregnancies also affect uh, uh, the metabolism, not just of the fetus, but also of the placenta. And again, this is one of these animals where you see the kidneys 
and you see these fetoplacental units here, including a spine of a fetus. P is the placenta here, it shows quite dark. And it's interesting that if you inject a, a deuterated glucose into an, a naive animal, you don't see any lactate made. It just goes to the, the glucose goes into the kidney, it goes into the bladder, and, and the HDO grows. But here, if you have actually a growth, and this is some, it's not cancer, but it's also something that is metabolically very active, you see how nicely uh, the pregnant animals uh, develop this lactate peak. Of course, the lactate peak is pretty small. I'm showing here the concentration in millimolar. Lactate is here magnified by five. So it's, it's, uh, it's in the order of between five and 10 millimolar only, whereas the glucose and water are, are much more concentrated. But it, the other thing that is interesting is that water is not spread out uniformly throughout the, the abdomen either. It also seems to be concentrated in the placenta. Uh, here I'm showing a, a sum over a time trace, and you see also the, the lactate arising from the fetoplacental unit, but also the, the water. This is another case that, that we're looking at with, uh, concerns pancreatic cancer. Again, you see very nicely, you inject glucose. Initially, you have the HDO peak, you inject, inject glucose, you see the water goes up by a lot, but you also have this very nice uh, peak of lactate. Now, if you look where the lactate is, again, the lactate is concentrated only where the tumor is. But the funny thing is the water also seems to be concentrated in the same area. Here you have another case, it's a different animal. Uh, Again, you see the lactate concentrated in the tumor. And if I erase the, the color map of the, you see here the, the concentrations uh, in millimolar here in this color map, if you raise the color map, you see that the, the water is also not diffused all over the place. Actually, it's concentrated in the same place as the lactate. So this is something we don't understand. Uh, we, we understand that water is reflected metabolism, the TCA cycle. We're not exactly sure why is it that we don't see it uniformly diffused over the animals. It seems uh, perhaps there is something related to water also in these experiments. Now, let me switch now to uh, NMR and to an experiment that, that was inspired in, in, a, in a way in a bike ride with my friend uh, Paul Shanda. Uh, that, that's very nice on the Alps on top of the clouds. And, and Paul, when he was a graduate student, he, he spent some time in my lab and, and he developed this, this uh, very important so fast NMR experiment, which eventually became the, the, the way in which most people are doing nowadays uh, biomolecular NMR. And the idea of the so fast experiment is if you want, if you're looking at uh, labile protons, for instance, most protein NMR is based on looking at uh, the amide groups of the protein. There is one amide group per, per, per amino acid in a, in a protein. So it gives you a peptide by peptide, amino acid by amino acid signature of your polypeptide. If, if you're going to be looking at NHs, only excite the NHs because then the rest of the protons that are in the protein plus the water can repolarize those NHs uh, very efficiently. And that increases the sensitivity a lot. And, and it allows you both higher sensitivity and, and much shorter recycle times. And so that, that improves the sensitivity of, a, of protein NMR a lot. And so we started wondering if, if the same could happen in a tissues, in, in, in the spectroscopy of tissues. And of course, it happens if you focus. Uh, now I've gone back to the regular chemical shift scale. Water is at 4.7 ppm out of the scale. Uh, if we do this relaxation enhanced experiments where we, we make a very narrow excitation profile, for instance, exciting only the, the, the protons between 7 and 9 ppm, then of course it works much better than if you do water gate water suppression or chest water suppression, because by killing the water, you also kill in a way indirectly the signal of these labile protons. But the surprise comes that when you look at the non labile protons, even if you look at the metals, you see that per unit time, the, the signals are also stronger and the T1s become the apparent T1. They are not the real T1s because whenever you do selective excitation that you're getting to get repolarization from the rest of the protons in your bath, 
then you get an apparent shortening in the T1. And, and this is an effect that becomes more and more dramatic as you go high in field. It, it was a little bit, it was obvious already at nine Tesla, but when we went to the 21 Tesla in the magnet lab, then the, the improvement in signal to noise was very dramatic. In just a few scans, you get a very nice spectra. For instance, if you're, if you're interested in, in metabolites uh, like NIA and lactate and so on, on which you can actually do diffusion, you have enough signal to noise to burn it in diffusion experiments. And of course, the same happens if you look at the exchangeable proton. So in this, this is an example where both the, where, where, where the water repolar and, and the non-excited polarization repolarizes both the labile protons and the non-labile protons. So th this has to do a little bit with this. Uh, this is again the cartoon that I was showing earlier related to CES. The, there are a bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, simultaneous processes that are talking to the speeds. There is the water exchanging with the labile protons, say the amides. This is a peptide group in a protein, and the water is exchanging with the amide groups. And then the aliphatic uh, protons are cross-relaxing. The, the, the aliphatic protons are in the side chain. They are cross-relaxing with the amine protons. And actually getting this cross-relaxation is very important. It's important to the point that it's the basis of a Nobel Prize, because if you can actually start looking at the, at the cross-relaxation via what's called the NOSI experiment, the nuclear overhauser effect spectroscopy experiment, that, and you look at the cross-relaxation between the side chains and the amide groups, you can actually start building also the distances between these protons and you can actually get the structure of a protein. And what is special is that you're getting it uh, in liquids in the actual, under actual physiological, physiologically relevant conditions. Now, if, if you go to, to your, or to my basic NMR graduate course and you calculate how big should these NOE effects be between protons, they should be 50%. That's, that's what it should be the thermodynamic limits. But it turns out that if you if you look at, at the kinetics, and these are some results from a, a, a very a, a model protein called ubiquitin, you see that the, the 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 if you look at the cross relaxation between the NHs and the CHs, the CHs start to build up because the protons of the NHs are passing polarization. But if they don't reach the thermodynamic limit, they get killed. They get killed by the fact that these NHs are also exchanging with water. And so each time that the NH exchanges with water, it forgot who it was, and it doesn't doesn't transfer the polarization. And so we're working with this cest experiment and relaxation experiment and so on. And in, in the meantime, we were also working on the side on some solid state NMR experiments with, with some colleagues here in the department that are specialists in, in the quantum zine effect. I'm not going to drive you crazy with the quantum zine effect, but you may know what Zeno's paradox is. It's that the that the arrow will never reach the the target, or uh, Achilles will never the best runner in Greece will never catch the tortoise, because each time that one moves, the other the other one you know you take a picture and the picture is static, and so it cannot be that static things ever reach a, a, a target. And of course, the you know it took Newton and Leibniz to to explain. It. Why, why that was not the case. And, and we demonstrated some of this uh, using some spin dynamics, but we demonstrated a, a related effect that my colleague Gershon Koritsky calls the anti zeno effect, which is, is when, whereby it, by looking at, at, the, at, at the object, what's called by doing a projection of your spin state, things instead of slowing down, speed up. And it turns out that this anti zeno effect is very related to the cest experiment because you know that that the, that the, this polarization that you're trying to transfer gets uh, uh, quenched by the exchanges with the solvent. But if you somehow stop the process and then you restart it again, in the meantime, the polarization that comes from the water has repolarized your labile protons. And so when it, the labile protons restart, they restart fresh. And so the, the cross relaxation keeps on building up and up and up. And then, this is called the Ramsey projection where you start something and then you stop it. It's called, a, 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 quantum people like to call it a projective measurement. And so 
by concatenating a series of projective measurements like these, you can actually see that, that the cross peak between the CHs and the NHs in ubiquity actually goes up and up by a lot versus what it would go in a normal NOE uh, transplant. And so we've been using this in the last couple of years. We started with something called intrinsically disordered proteins. Uh, I'm showing you here in more recent examples that, that we collected this year on the gigahertz, uh, where you can see that these cross peaks are, are stronger than these cross peaks, not much stronger, maybe a factor of two or three. But if you do sugars or, or you do glycans, you see that the enhancement between the OHs and the CHs of the sugar is actually pretty large. And if you do nucleic acids, it's even larger, it can be a factor of about six. Nucleic acid research is based on looking at the amino, which are these NHs that, that uh, make the base pairs, uh, both in DNA and in RNA. And so these are, these are some examples of how much this kind of experiments can, can help you. We, we combine them with something called Hadamard encoding, and then that's, that's a form of compressed sensing. But you can see here on, on black conventional NOE experiment to the NOE experiment on this uh, RNA fragment collected in four and a half hours. These tall peaks are the diagonal, and the little peaks are the cross peaks that actually carry the structural information. And you, show, you see here in red what we get in 24 minutes. You can also compare here these two different experiments. And we started doing this a year ago. We were doing this experiment a year ago, and I was talking now with Orr. And uh, in the same way as you guys were shut down when in May or, or something like that, we were shut down in March uh, because of this coronavirus unless you are doing some corona-related research. And it turns out that the, these experiments work wonderfully in the fragments of RNA of corona. And so if you translate the signal to noise gains into the length of the experiments, you can see that you can go from a conventional experiment that in a couple of days looks like this uh, to a noisy experiment that in a, an hour and a half looks like this. And these are, of course, these are these are traces, the, the blue, the green, and the red are different traces. And the, the cross peaks are the information that you're looking for. And so, so this has been, uh, this allowed us to reopen the lab and then that, that was quite nice. And the, I, I still want to stress the, 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 the fact that this is a little bit related to cysts in the sense that it's not now that, that you're pulsing on the NH and you're looking at the water, but you're pulsing on the NH and the NH is losing all its money, but the water keeps on repolarizing it. And so in the end, it can pass a lot of information on the CH. So the NH acts like a valve in passing the, the, the information from the water to the non laval protons. And the, 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 I showed you this for what's called homonuclear correlation experiments where we're correlating a, a proton with proton dimensions, it, it, the same tricks can work on heteronuclear experiments. You can use the water and actually bring out peaks like, like, like some of these uh, uridine peaks in this, in, in this uh, COVID fragment that would always, otherwise be lost in the noise. Okay. In fact, you can go even a step farther and you can play the same kind of tricks to detect not just non-labile protons, not non-labile carbons. This is a, car a spectrum of glucose, honest to God spectrum of glucose detected on the water signal, not on, not on the carbons themselves. Okay, so in the last uh, five minutes, I'd like to, to, to tell you about something else. And I have to talk about nuclear hyperpolarization because everyone is doing nuclear hyperpolarization. And so we're talking about water and what, what could the dynamic nuclear polarization do for us? And first of all, you probably know what DMP is. DMP is, is a low temperature experiment where you pass polarization from in a cryogenic pellet from an electron to surrounding nuclei by saturating the, the electron. You, you, you look at uh, the la la electron Larmo frequency plus minus the, the nuclear Larmo frequency. One gives you plus enhancement. The other one gives you minus enhancement. But of course, you're not interested in doing perhaps this at one Kelvin. So you suddenly, this is the idea of, of a of uh, Aaron K. Larsen and Goldman, you suddenly dissolve this signal. And for a time T1 or a couple of if T1s, you have a super signal where instead of looking at 10 ppm polarizations, you look at 10% polarization. 
And so that, that, that is used and we use that tool. I'm showing here another example of this pancreatic cancer model where you can clearly see the, the concentration of the lactate in the tumor to highlight metabolism and so on. Now, could we use that to do proteins as well? And the, the, the answer is no, because the, the, the sample has to jump from the hyperpolarizer to the NMR or to the MRI. And if, if, you, if you look at the BPP the relaxation theory in 1948, you see that the dependence of T1 with magnetic field strength for something that tumbles in the order of a nanosecond, the correlation time of in the order of a nanosecond, the T1 just goes into the milliseconds or submilliseconds. So in the transfer, even if the transfer takes only a second, you lost everything. And so, oops, that's not good. I'm sorry. So I I destroyed the slide. Okay. So what we started doing, I, I just tell you with words, is since we cannot port the large molecule, we will port the small molecule. And the small molecule will be water. But what we do is we hyperpolarize the water. We call this hyper W. We hyperpolarize the water and the, the protein is waiting in a tube or, or the biomolecule is waiting in a tube. We also did it on animals where we injected the hyperpolarized water on animals. But in general, what I'm going to show you is the water is waiting in a tube and then the water comes in and these labile protons of the water exchange with the, la uh, this, uh, the protons of the water exchange with the labile protons of the biomolecule. And the, this is an example of what you see if you use a conventional uh, protein. This is a molar protein, Barstar, that even us, uh, even we can do, we can uh, synthesize. And you, you get enhancements. You can see here the enhancements that you get on the peaks. We look at the peaks by 2 DNMR because 1 DNMR, it's, it's uh, very crowded. And, and the water lasts for long enough a polarized that, of course, we don't touch it. We only pulse, like like Paul Shanda taught, taught us in the so fast experiments. We only uh, pulse on the seven to nine ppm region, and uh, you can see that that the spectra are indeed uh, polarized by a lot. The signal enhancements go between ten and hundred, but you also see that the enhancements are not uniform, and the enhancements map one to one the facility with which the individual amide groups in the protein exchange with the water. So it's a, it's a, it's a reverse test in a way. Instead of looking at the water, the water comes hyperpolarized. It hyperpolarizes the sites, provided that the sites uh, exchange rapidly with the water. Uh, and we measure that using a Kleenex experiment where we kill all the protons in the protein. We wait for 40 milliseconds. Only those that repolarize from the water got, uh, got enhanced. Of course, these are two very different experiments. What I'm showing you, the hyper W experiment, the hyperpolarized experiment is a 36, 30 second long experiment. And what I'm showing you in the clinics is something like 48 hours long. So the, the time scales of the experiments are, are very different. And it, it, again, it works very well with RNAs. It, it gives you even larger enhancements. Life with RNAs turns out to be very comfortable because the aminos, these aminos that also in DNA, that make the base pairs, they are very far away from water. They're between 11 and 14 ppm. So they are very easy to work with using selective pulses and so on. And, and so we get very large enhancements in the order of several hundred. And by the way, the concentration of all these molecules is pretty small. It's in the order of 100 micromolar. <clears throat> but then we did one experiment too many. And the, the, it's an experiment on a, on a complicated molecule in the sense that this is a protein. Uh, it, 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 it comes out from something that's called a, a GPCR, a receptor, a membrane protein receptor. It's a, it's a molecule where it coexists folded and unfolded forms at the same time. And the, of course, we are expecting to enhance the unfolded form, which is open like a spaghetti and exchanging with the water much more than the folded form. And it turns out that when you look at the enhancements of the folded form, you can see that because you can check them residue by residue, they end up being uh, about between five and 10 times bigger than the unfolded form. And so this is something that, that we are also struggling to understand uh, what is it that we see. Okay, so this brings me to the end. I started with some imaging experiments and this I think you also know water 
when you look at water, you have a wonderful reporter of microscopic structure. If you, if you combine it with cysts, you start seeing metabolites. If perhaps with deuterium, you can also see using, use the water to see metabolism. And then there are different sites to this coin of the exchange between the water and the metabolites. You can look from the metabolites towards the water, but you can also use the water to repolarize the metabolite, get better signal to noise if you don't touch the water and get much better signal to noise if you hyperpolarize water. But I also think I showed you that, that we don't understand 100% of the things that we see, and that's part of, of the, the fun of it. So let me, uh, I'd like to end by acknowledging my collaborators. I think I mentioned, or you may have seen the names of some, of course, the people in the Magnum Lab, Jens Rosenberg, uh, all the breast cancer work we do in collaboration and the prostate cancer work we do in collaboration with Shiva, which is a big hospital not too far from us. The placenta, we, we do the work with our colleague, Michal Neeman, and the pancreatic cancer is with the uh, colleague, uh, Abidor Scherz, also at the Institute. RNA with Harald Schwabe from uh, Frankfurt and the protein work we do together with Rina Rosenzweig. This is our anti-Zeno guru, uh, Gershon Kuritsky and Eric Skupcha with whom we have a long-standing collaboration. I'd like to thank my group, but you know, this is the picture that uh, I could show you now from my group, but I don't want to show you this. I'd rather show you this one from times uh, where we would get together and, and have dinner at home. And I'm showing you here the, the work, the deuterium work uh, from Stefan and the, the SPEN work from Chinja and Odelia and Martins and Zihong, the hyperpolarized work from Greg and Orr, and then some other people that they, they, this work I didn't mention. <clears throat> and I'd like to, to conclude with a little bit of advertisement. In the last couple of years, We've really begun an MR fest. I showed some of it. I showed you the, the work from the gigahertz, from the 15 Tesla animal machine, from the hyperpolarizers that some of them we built and some of them we buy. And the, we have now a seven Tesla working. And of course, I'm not the only one that, that works on magnetic resonance. I have lots of colleagues. And, and the most important thing is that over the last four years, we've had three colleagues and we're still hiring and we're still looking for, for people to join each one of these. It's, uh, of course, an independent PI. Uh, I'd like to thank my funding sources for the imaging and for the spectroscopy and for the Human Placenta Project and the Thompson Foundation for, uh, for uh, the pancreatic cancer. We're looking for uh, uh, people that like to do these kind of things. We're, interface some quantum mechanics and instrumentation, image and data processing, and uh, try to bring it all together for COVID, placenta, cancer, basic studies, whatever whatever interests you. We are, we are looking for uh, victims to join us. And I'd like to stop by thanking you with uh, a little bit of MRI. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Friedman, for this great talk. We now move to the Q&A phase. Uh, we have our first question from Chris. Chris, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. <clears throat> A really nice talk, Lucio. I really enjoyed it. I, I have one question about the, the CEST experiments with the semi-solid component that was decreased in the tumors. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas on what's different? Is the lipid composition, the fluidity, or the exchange rates? What's different? In well, we are uh, we are we are actively trying to look at it. Let me see. I have some uh, <clears throat> uh, backup slides on these. Let me see if if any of them is uh, is relevant. You know, we we. You know, we 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 try to to distinguish them by multidimensional NMR. Uh, I, I don't think I have the slides here, but we're, we're trying to answer the question by multidimensional NMR. Uh, and and we definitely see lots of of uh, of things that have to do with proteins and of lipids. But uh, but I cannot give you at the moment a one-to-one -one answer. 
Okay. Yeah, we're we've seen sort of very well somewhat similar changes in our assessed fingerprinting, looking at the concentrations and exchange rates, where we see a decrease in in tumors. And, but we're quite not not quite sure how to explain it ourselves yet. Uh, yeah. What exactly it is that's causing? What, what we're doing is we're doing ex vivo multidimensional experiments. That's that's the way we're trying to to answer it at the moment. Okay. And try to see if uh, if you know we we. We do these uh, uh, wax filters, and we try to see, and we, and we see this magnetization transfer component uh, changing, and then we try to see 2D correlations of that magnetization transfer component with anything else. And uh, but but so far, uh, first it's ex vivo because these are longer experiments, and uh, and we do them at high fields as well. And they, but the answer is still not univocal. Okay, thanks. Great, uh, next question from Bruce. Hey there. Um, first, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, I, I enjoyed it, uh, although I admit I don't understand uh, all of what I just heard, but uh, plenty uh, of uh, things for me to think about and certainly generally reinforces an impression I've had for many, many years, which is uh, even a small signal on top of an 80 molar, you know, water signal, uh, you know, can uh, often beat uh, a, a much larger uh, change in a very much smaller uh, signal you're looking at. So uh, uh, I, I love the focus uh, on water. It's, you know, one of the few molecules I would pretend to understand, but uh, you've certainly shown some data that uh, suggests otherwise. Right. Uh, whenever, whenever we think we understand what we're doing, then one we do one experiment too many and then... <laughs> Yeah, I love, I love that. I, I was uh, especially drawn to the um, uh, your uh, experience with the deuterated uh, glucose and the kind of spatial persistence uh, of the um, what presumably is that you know deuterated water as a result from that exactly. Um, you know, first, is there any chance that um, uh, the deuterium has found itself to some other uh, you know molecule that? Uh, uh, you know, would be uh, indistinguishable based on, uh, you know, uh, the spectral characteristics. So and, if to, not, to, and if not, like, what else that we would think about that, uh, you know. So, um, so two things uh, to point out is, one is notice that this is, these are minutes. So these are really long uh, time scales. Yeah. So what we are doing at the moment and I don't know if we're wasting scanner time or not, because signal to noise is not with us, is we're doing something called double quantum filter experiments. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the deuterium is a spin one, and it turns out that if it's bound, as you say, uh, the Got a easiness with which you could excite the plus minus one, according to people that did it on, on a, excise the, the, the spinal cords and, and things like that, it goes up. And if you're super lucky, you can actually see what's called the quadrupolar splitting surrounding the, the water peak. So we're trying to do that in vivo. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Signal to noise is uh, it's uh, still not with us, even at 15 Tesla, but we're, that, that we're trying. So I, I think it's a, I think it's an excellent question. If you could all be seen in the bladder or something like that, then I know it's the water washing away. But because because of this persistence. No, I mean, and and of course, you know, the water is generated in the mitochondria specifically. So you want to believe that the, that that's that's the fingerprint you're seeing. Some some mitochondrial interesting mitochondrial biophysics uh, and and that would be super interesting exactly. and, and very relevant to be able to measure it i think it's a great observation and, and uh, eventually if you uh, uh, let me see if i can slide my if i can go back uh, eventually uh, the water peak becomes real by far the easiest one to observe sure you see, it, it's going up to, you know, by a factor of about four of what it was in this particular case, but in cancers, in tumors, it goes even higher. So if you could, 
give the glucose and, and look at the animal two hours later, I mean, the animal does not need to be in the scanner, of course, uh, and it tells you something, that would be really nice. And besides, you don't have to do spectroscopic imaging, you just do imaging. No, exactly, and, and can then do other things like measure the relaxation properties. Uh, uh, it, you know, the fact that it may be related to, uh, you know, the origin of where it's coming from, you know, mitochondrial, you know, ultrastructure uh, is, is a super interesting uh, domain to pursue. And there's certainly reasons to think that would be different in tumors and in other disease states. It would be, you know, fascinating to be able to pursue this as a, as a way to interrogate, you know, mitochondrial biophysics uh, in, in a, and to me, a novel way. I agree. I agree. Great, next question from Larry. Uh, thanks, Lucia. That was a great talk again. Uh, and next time you're in Boston, be sure don't slip. Don't slip by. I was supposed to give the wall lecture last November or whenever, but you know, it all went up in flames. Uh, uh, so. Okay. Well, definitely let us know next time. Yeah, I was uh, intrigued by the the so fast experiments and where you as where you periodically were saturating, I guess the NH groups, uh, and you're doing it periodically to allow them to repolarize and thus have more to transfer to the other protons, if I'm correct about that. And yep. um, I was just wondering what the T1 of those groups are and if there was any benefit, if T1 is much longer than T2, there might be a benefit of doing a selective flip back pulse to achieve that same effect, but, but faster, cycle it faster, or okay. even an enhanced radiation damping repolarization. So in, in, in these particular experiments, we are, uh, I think that's why I'm showing, uh, showing it in the gigahertz a, a little bit. <clears throat> so the gigahertz life becomes easier because we use selective pulses. So we only address the NH experiments and, and the NH groups and the, the, yeah. The T1 is not that short, but it, the apparent T1 becomes short because it's the water that, that is relaxing the protons. It's replacing the protons in a way. I see. So it's an, an exchange process. It's, uh... it's an exchange. But you, can, you see the, the fact that we are doing, that we are not waiting enough. I, I, I hope I'm, I'm pointing this. You see these, these artifacts, these anti-diagonals? Uh -huh. I, I don't know if, if you can see them, but uh, let me see if... Uh, yeah, you can see them. You, you can see them, okay. Yeah. So this anti-diagonal is, uh, is witness to the fact that we are not letting it relax it sufficiently. Uh, so they, they should not be there. They are progressive saturations that, that should not be there. Hmm. Uh, they don't show up in the sugars, they don't show up in the nucleic acids, but in the folded proteins, we are, we are not uh, waiting long enough. Now, the truth is that you can do the same trick without the water if you take a paramagnetic label bound to ubiquity. And then you have this paramagnetic shifted residues that relax very fast. And they never, they've never been seen to build any cross relaxation with the rest of the protein simply because the paramagnetic center relaxes them. But what this allows you to do is to, you know, keep on pumping the information, their information, which is very quickly and passing it to these slowly relaxing protons. And we've managed to see also in paramagnetic systems, this kind of effect. So the water shortens the upper NT1, again, in this particular case, not enough. But uh, you don't really, anything that would shorten the T1 of the giving proton without affecting the receiving proton is, uh, is gay. So what, what is the apparent T1 then? Is it tens of milliseconds or milliseconds? Yes, tens of milliseconds. So yes, it's pretty, pretty yes. fast, I see. Uh, I don't have the exact number here, but I think it's, I, I, I think we wait uh, about 100 milliseconds and, and we expect a full recovery. So it's about 40 milliseconds or so. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question from Ovidio. 
Yeah, so it's a really fantastic result that uh, we have seen. Uh, thank you for this uh, sharing with us. Uh, so I would like to ask you, like, uh, if you, for people that are interested to translate uh, such methods into humans with clinical scanners, there are some limitations compared to the performance of clinical scanners versus animal scanners in terms of the RF pulses that you can play, um, B1, uh, like B1 max and voltages that you can reach and the duration and the SAR that you can play. Um, and especially for relaxation enhanced MRS uh, experiments or the uh, cross um, the cross span uh, mm -hmm. type of measurements. Do you see that uh, like um, uh, that the, um, um, the performance of the human scanners would allow uh, such uh, control of the uh, of the pulse sequence that to, to enable this type of uh, of uh, measurements on on human scanners at the moment. So, so, so there are in a way two two kind of sequences here. There are the spectroscopy sequences, and in the spectroscopy sequences, the the SAR is not that high because the duty the duty cycles are not. Uh, that uh, heavy. Uh, in a way, the the SAR that you deposit is going to be given by the bandwidth of the pulse times the pulse angle. And the bandwidths here are relatively uh, narrow. Uh, the pulse angles are not necessarily 90 either, because you it, they are kind of a compromise an Ernst angle kind of compromise between the upper and T1 uh, and recycle delay. So uh, I think that the main problem will be that to achieve this kind of selectivity at the three Tesla would be difficult. At seven Tesla, life would be much easier. And, and, and I don't think that this would be a problem uh, at seven Tesla. With the imaging experiments that they, that I was describing at the beginning, where we do a frequency swept pulse, there again we increase the bandwidth of the indirect or the phase encoded the dimension, but that is again bandwidth times pulse angle is the SAR, and so there you do pay a price in SAR, and the and that is a problem that that. The, of course, it's it's less of a problem on animals, but that is a problem on humans, and that I imagine would be even more of a problem at 70, the higher the field. So for the spectroscopy, I don't think that uh, that that this would be a problem. No, I, I mean the pulses would have to be long at three tesla, maybe too long to be useful, but at seven tesla, it should be fine. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so I don't see any other questions at this point. Professor Friedman, thank you so much for coming here today and we hope to My see pleasure. you in person soon. Great. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure, bye-bye.